This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom for our ongoing Nuclear Free Future conversation. And I welcome you, viewers. My name is Margaret Harrington, your host. And please welcome with me our guest, Arnie Gunderson, the Chief Engineer of Fairwinds Energy Education. And welcome back, Arnie. Thank you so much for returning to our program. Yeah, hi, Margaret. Thanks, Thanks for having me again. Yes, and the subject that we have chosen for this week is... The gift that keeps on giving, nuclear waste. And now, Arnie, what exactly is nuclear waste? Well, first off, it's a great title for the Christmas season when we're all thinking about gifts. <laughs> uh, but the nuclear waste has two different types. Um, I think the most frightening is what's euphemistically called spent nuclear fuel. And it's stored in, again, another euphemism, a spent nuclear fuel pool. Um, you now, in fact, we are storing uh, 40 years worth of nuclear waste in swimming pools that are, um, in a lot of cases, on the roofs of our nuclear reactors. For example, this is at Vermont Yankee, and this is an, an issue, an ongoing issue, about what to do with the spent nuclear fuel. Yeah, there's uh, 100 nuclear plants in the country, and 30 of them, uh, the Mark I reactors like Vermont Yankee and the Mark II reactors like one in Washington State, um, 30 of them store their nuclear waste in a pool that's essentially on the roof of the nuclear uh, reactor. And how much fuel does that, for example, at Vermont Yankee, they, is it full? Is it a full pool now? You know, when I, when I got out of college, the theory was, this was 1972, same year of Vermont Yankee, got its operating license. The theory was that you'd store the waste in a pool for five years, and then you would ship it somewhere to be uh, reprocessed. Well, reprocessing never worked, and we don't have any kind of uh, uh, reprocessing facility in the United States uh, to, to uh, do anything with this nuclear fuel. Well, when that piece of the, of the chain broke, there was no place to send the nuclear waste to. So it has sat in that nuclear fuel pool um, for upwards of 40 years now. So it's the same uh, pool that was there 40 years ago at Vermont Yankee, which has applied, which has gotten a 20-year extension on its, uh, on its contract. Yeah, you know, when, when I was a senior vice president in the industry, we built nuclear fuel racks in the division that I ran. And uh, so that the nuclear fuel are these long 12-foot high bundles of spaghetti. Uh -huh. And uh, the spaghetti is the nuclear fuel um, rods, and they're held together. So um, originally, there was huge gaps between each one of these bundles in the nuclear pool. But then when people realized that they were running out of space, there was a business opportunity for my division. We wound up consolidating this nuclear fuel and putting no more nuclear fuel in the same size swimming pool. And we actually re-racked power plants two or three times because everybody thought well another two or three years we'll be reprocessing it never happened well now Vermont Yankees got um, about 35 of its 40 years worth of nuclear waste in the pool it's as full as it can get um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission requires that you be able to offload one entire nuclear reactors worth of fuel so there's a little place in the pool where they can remove all the fuel from the nuclear reactor other than that, the entire pool is full. Um, so what they're doing with it is they're taking it and uh, putting it in something called dry cask storage. Um, and they'll, so they lift it uh, into a canister that weighs about 100 tons and, uh, for shielding. Because this is still, for, even after 35 years, this is extraordinarily radioactive. Um, they lift it into that container and put a lid on it, and then they lift it off the roof and down this equipment hatch to the basement, and there they put it into a concrete shield, the thing that weighs another couple hundred tons. Mm -hmm. And each one of those goes, gets driven out on something that looks like a, a bulldozer and set out along the Connecticut River on a, on a concrete pad. Now, uh, the, these dry casks, are, are much safer than storing nuclear waste in the, in the, on the roof in a swimming pool. Much safer. But they cost money. 
uh, it would cost Entergy of Vermont Yankee something on the order of $100 million to take the fuel off the roof and put it all in these dry casks on the ground. So are the existing dry casks at Vermont Yankee full at this point? Well, there's seven of them that are full. They really need about 40. Mm -hmm. And, um, th and that's, that, of course, is the problem. Um, when it's on the roof, it's our risk. But it's Entergy's profit. And so what's happening at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is that they are making arguments saying that it's not risky storing nuclear fuel on the roof and that... Um, it's perfectly fine to wait until these plants are shut down for good. For my Yankee, in the case, it would be 2032. Now, what's really happening is when that happens, a switch gets flipped, and storing it then comes out of ratepayers' pockets. It comes out of the decommissioning fund. Mm -hmm. So if Entergy can wait until the plant shuts down for good, then they're not on the hook for that $100 million to take the fuel out. You and I are. And at this moment, the only place to put it is into the dry cask storage. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the, the next problem. You hit, on, hit the nail on the head. The next problem is that um, there's no place to store this for the long term. This stuff is radioactive for a quarter of a million years. Maybe I should talk about half-life here. Yes, and, pl and well, my question was, uh, the first question is, what is in the nuclear waste? Because most of us don't, uh, we, we, prefer not to think about it at all. And thinking of it as waste is something that does go away. Yeah. But you're emphasizing that this does not go away. Yeah. So but what, it, what is in it? Well, it's, um, there's a whole witch's blend of, of radioactive materials. Um, there's cesium. Now, cesium has a 30-year half-life. Um, now, what that means is that after 30 years, it's half gone. After 60 years, it's a quarter left. After 90 years, it's an eighth left. And finally, after about 300 years, it's all gone. Um, then there's strontium-90, same thing, 30-year half-life. Um, but there's also, every nuclear pool has several tons of plutonium. And uh, plutonium is named after Pluto, and Pluto is the god of hell. Um, it's a really nasty radioactive isotope. And it's got a 24,000-year half-life. So in 24,000 years, half will be gone. In another 24,000, there'll be a quarter left. You have to store the stuff for about a quarter of a million years before it goes away. And we're just sitting with, it, with this stuff right now on the roof of the building of Vermont Yankee, or it could be Pilgrim or Oyster Creek. They're, they're all over the country. Um, and uh, obviously, we're not going to store the stuff on the roof for a quarter of a million years. And plutonium is used for? Plutonium is, uh, is, is something you can make a bomb from. That's the a problem. bomb. Problem number one a is A nuclear that, bomb. Yes, yeah. a nuclear bomb. Uh, and there's, um, it only takes about 10 or 20 pounds of uranium to make a nuclear bomb. And there's tons of it on the roof at Vermont Yankee. Uh, oh, you said uranium. and. Uh, with uh, plut plutonium, yes, right? Yes, I'm sorry, plutonium. To plutonium. Make a, there's only 20, rough, roughly 20 pounds or less of plutonium to make a bomb. And there's tons of it on the roof. So there's enough plutonium to make hundreds of, of weapons. So that's problem number one. But problem number two is that it's um, very, um, uh, it causes cancer very easily. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, very small quantities of uh, plutonium Will, um, will induce a cancer. We've got a picture on, the, on our website of uh, a plutonium particle lodged in an ape lung. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can get it on Google, too. Um, and it shows the decay, the particles that shoot out of that plutonium particle and are systematically destroying the ape's lung. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's truly a frightening uh, isotope because it's so uh, carcinogenic and it lasts so long. And it must be so tiny also. Yeah. Can, you know, how uh, can you see it? Well, a, a dollar bill is, weighs about a gram. Mm -hmm. And um, a microgram, that's a millionth of the weight of a dollar bill, you know, smaller than George Washington's eyeball, uh, mm -hmm. is enough to cause a cancer. So plutonium is extraordinarily uh, carcinogenic. 
Now, and the fear is that unless we find a permanent place to put this stuff, one, the bad guys might get it and make a bomb, mm -hmm. or two, it might, uh, it might break or be attacked by terrorists and released to the air and cause cancer. So there's no, um, there's no upside to storing nuclear waste. There's no positive benefits that we derive from storing nuclear waste. And, but when you're talking about nuclear waste, you're talking about all of this mixed together. As you described it, a witch's brew. And so that the bad guys would separate then the plutonium from the cesium and, and the uh, strontium-90. Yes, yes. You know, there's a, a great discussion. Um, so right now, we don't have any place to put this stuff. Um, yeah. The government had wanted Yucca Mountain to be the place, and that's in Nevada. Yes. Um, that was never chosen scientifically. That was chosen politically. And it was affectionately called the Screw Nevada Law when, yeah. they, when they chose Yucca Mountain. When you say chosen politically, what do you mean by that? Uh, Congress voted on it, and they said, um, well, actually, they started by having two waste repositories, one in the east, one in the west. Mm -hmm. Well, there's not anywhere near as the number of registered voters in Nevada as there are in the East. So yeah. the, um, the Eastern site disappeared off everybody's radar, and the waste dump got, got stuck in Nevada. Well, this happened in the 80s, and there was a young man named Harry Reid who had no political clout at all, who is now in charge of the United States Senate. He comes from Nevada. Right. right. Uh, so one of the reasons uh, there's been a political move to stop it is, one, there's no science to support the, the facility, and two, Harry Reid runs, runs the Senate. And so it's not going to happen on Harry Reid's watch. Mm -hmm. Now, originally, this was probably pushed as a good uh, source of jobs, right? I mean, to build up Yucca Mountain. It would bring, bring billions of dollars of federal money to the state. Well, there still are people in Nevada who are saying, we'll take the waste because we want the jobs. You know, mm -hmm. that's a, that, boy, that's a Faustian bargain. You got uh, jobs for no more than 100 years, and you wind up with waste for a quarter of a million years. So... To me, it doesn't seem to be a very good, um, uh, a very good trade-off. And when they chose the site, I believe that it has some seismic issues about it. Well, they it's um, they are as they got into the site, they found a lot of seismic problems yeah. uh, that they hadn't realized when they started, yeah. and they found water. Now uh, that's a problem. Uh, having moisture near nuclear fuel in a highly seismic area. They thought the mountain was dry and they thought it had no cracks in it. And in fact, it has cracks and it has water. So How does a scientist think, right? I mean, the, the scientist thought that there was no water there. I mean, how does that happen? You're a scientist. What, how did, how, what does it take to make a mistake like that? Well, it didn't get called the Screw Nevada Act for nothing. You know? yeah. I think there were scientists even 30 years ago who realized it's not a great location. Mm. Um, and uh, but but related to that though is they as they got into it they found more. This is in the middle of a desert, you know. And you say, well, it doesn't. There's not many earthquakes out here, and it's a desert. How how can it be wet? Mm. But in fact, they found moisture. And one of the problems was that they couldn't figure out what to do with the moisture. So the scientists on the job, even five years ago, said, well, a hundred years from now, when this facility is full, we'll figure out how to do it. And we'll put these titanium raincoats over these things. We haven't designed them yet. We don't know if they'll work. But we'll worry about that problem 100 years from now. And we think that may cost about $10 billion more. Mm -hmm. So we never solved the problem by even considering Yucca Mountain. We just kicked the can down the road. And, um, um, you know, it, it, was, it was never a closed solution. It was never the... Um, the be-all and end-all that the pro-nuclear people would suggest it is. And at the present moment, I believe that there's a new head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who is, has come in with some new ideas about a repository for nuclear waste in the United States. Yeah, the, the chairman of the NRC, um, the previous chairman, was a guy named Gregory Yasko, and he was, Congress chased him out. He was run out of town on a rail. Uh, the new chairman is a, a woman named Allison McFarland, and she's got her doctorate in, uh, in geology. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she's on record as saying that Yucca Mountain's a bad choice. So we really need to open up the, the process again. Now, so the good news is we will find a better place. 
Uh, the bad news is it opens up the entire country. And uh, the granite of New England, like in New Hampshire, and some of that granite runs over into Vermont, um, appears to be an excellent place to put nuclear waste. So it may be that um, uh, you know, we've been calling for it to leave Vermont, but if it just moves across the river and winds up in a mountain in New Hampshire, and we get 100 other reactors worth, it doesn't seem to be a very good trade-off either. Well, the prospect is frightening to anybody living in, in New England. You know, I, I, was, um, I was in Chicago uh, on December 2nd. And December 2nd was the 70th anniversary of the first nuclear chain reaction that happened a block away from where the symposium I spoke at was. Um, and, um, um, and the discussion revolved around just that. What are we going to do with this waste and how... Um, how do we make it less harmful? And, and the first thing you have to do if, is if you want to solve, if, you're, if you've dug a hole that, and you've gotten into trouble from digging the hole, the first thing you should do is stop digging. Mm -hmm. But we continue to create more waste by continuing to run these nuclear reactors. Um, and, uh, you know, I spoke to that in my speech out there in Chicago. Yeah, and, and it's, the issue is not only running the old nuclear reactors, but building the new ones. Right, and mm. extending licenses. You know, like here's Vermont Yankee. A, a deal is a deal. We had a 40-year deal with Vermont Yankee, and everybody made a lot of money on it, and it was time to shut it down. So now we increase the power by 20%, and we give it a 20-year license extension. The net effect is that it almost doubles the amount of weight, waste. 40 years at a low power and 20 years at a, a, an increased power, not quite, but almost doubles the amount of waste that we had as a, um, as a problem. You know, um, Peter Shumlin, he's now governor, but back before he was governor, um, he, he said to me at a, at a town meeting, he said, you know, if you want to shut down Vermont Yankee, store that nuclear waste in City Hall Park in the center of Burlington. Let's see how the people in Burlington react to having nuclear waste in their backyard. Yeah, and how long would it take us to wake up at that point? And, and that's the reason why we have this program, Arnie. The viewers and myself, uh, well, it, it's easy to forget about this issue. It's, it's something that we can keep pushing away, and, and it doesn't come into our range of consciousness. And it mustn't have come into the range of consciousness of those, I think it was 260 people who, uh, who crowded the uh, public service board hearing to, uh, to extend uh, the Vermont, Yan Vermont Yankee, the license for Mont Vermont Yankee here in, in Vermont. And they were all supporters of Energy Vermont Yankee and uh, at the recent public service board hearing. But uh, what was the outcome of that public service board hearing? You know, the, the, the people that were supporters were employees, you know, they, the, they, uh, and business people in the community. And, and I think it's at the issue of I can have my job for 20 more years versus what am I going to do with the waste for 250,000 more years? And um, I think intellectually people just have a really hard time comparing something really tangible right now, money in my pocket for 20 years, versus, oh my God, that's, we're talking about hundreds of generations of kids that will be put at risk by storing the waste. The, the outcome of the hearing was uh, some great favorable press for Vermont Yankee, um, because the, the supporters of it basically overwhelmed it, um, the hearing, with, um, with positive, um, it's a job, it's good for the community, it pays for my fire truck, and, and things like that. Now, when we're talking about nuclear waste, it's not just in the United States, it's not just in Vermont, it's all over the world, and particularly what comes to mind now in less than two years after the triple meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi is what are they doing with the nuclear waste in, in Japan? Now, Fukushima Daiichi is closed, and as well as most of the nuclear power plants in Japan. Could you give us an update on that, Arnie? Because I know you've been there recently again. Yeah, I, I was there in September. Um, what are they doing with the nuclear waste? They never thought about that. They've never thought about what are we going to do on the most seismically active island in the world for a quarter of a million years. They always thought that they could reprocess the fuel and somehow make it go away. From a policy level, they never said, where on this island can we put this stuff? 
There was talk that they were making a deal with Mongolia to ship it over to Mongolia. And then the Mongols had more sense than the Japanese and said, we don't want your nuclear fuel. So the, um, there really is no great site for nuclear waste in Japan because the whole island, Japan has one half of 1% of all the land on the planet. And it has more than 10% of the earthquakes. Mm. So it's, it's just the wrong place to even consider putting nuclear waste. But I mean, Vermont's not gonna raise his hand and say, well, we'll take it. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult choice. And what are they doing? Are they transporting the nuclear waste in the country? Um, the the high-level waste continues to sit in the nuclear fuel pools. Um, and at Fukushima Daiichi, there's, uh, of course, th four nuclear fuel pools, all of them on the roof, have had their roofs blown off. So the, the, the high-level waste is, is basically facing directly into the atmosphere now. And um, uh, they have a... No, I wish they were moving urgently, but the, I don't believe they're moving fast enough. They have a program underway to pull the nuclear fuel out of two of the fuel pools before about 2015, 2016. But there's enough waste in that pool to equal all of the atomic bombs that were ever fired above ground. The 700 atomic bombs were fired above ground from the time I was a kid in the 50s all the way through to the program stopped in the 70s. Uh, all of that nuclear waste that was shot up by the atomic bombs, each one of those pools has more than that in it. So the fear is, and, and the, uh, is that the pool can uh, overheat and burn. Uh, if, the, if the water were to, um, because of a seismic event, if the water were to uh, run out, the pools would get hot enough to burn in air. The, the metal, called zircholae, is um, there's something called pyrophoric. It burns in air. So when it gets hot enough, it just starts to burn, and all of that radiation then can get liberated. Mm -hmm. And what happened? There was a recent low-level, so-called low-level earthquake, wasn't there? Yeah, there was a, well, it was a 7-3, which is a bad earthquake, but it was um, 125 miles offshore. So by the time it got to the site, it wasn't a 7-3 anymore. You know, it, it attenuates with distance. Um, but it was bad on site. Uh, I have said that if the site has a 7, not 100 miles away, but if the site has a, a 7, we're likely to crack the nuclear fuel pool. Um, there's a study out this week that talks about the integrity of the concrete on site. Um, to put out the accident, they didn't have fresh water because the tsunami had destroyed all the fresh water. So they had to pump salt water into the nuclear reactor. And now concrete and salt water don't get along very well. Um, you know, look at the Burlington parking garage, you know, and you have the yeah. salt from cars, you, you know, pretty quickly crapping out the concrete in the garages. Same thing in a, in a fuel pool where you've got salty water in contact with concrete. So the big concern is that in the event of an earthquake, the concrete will crack, the pool will drain, at which point the fuel will burn in air. And uh, it could mean cutting Japan in half for centuries. The, if, the, if, the, if the cloud ran across Japan, it would contaminate Japan from east to west and contaminate it for centuries. So that there would essentially be people in northern Japan and people in southern Japan, but there would be a no man's zone in the middle. And that's the fear of um, the, a, a lot of scientists. And that's why I've been pushing and um, two Japanese ambassadors have been, I've been working with to try to get the Japanese to move it faster. The, the safest place we have right now are those dry casks. We're trying to force Tokyo Electric to move it faster. Mm -hmm. And what is the prospect for that? How are the, I understand that the people in Japan have been out demonstrating, and which is very uncharacteristic for them throughout their their history. They never really speak up and uh, against something, and will just follow the way the government goes. And but here there is an exception. Uh, yeah, it's um, eighty percent of the Japanese do not want the nuclear power plants to start back up. Mm. And of the 54 nuclear plants, only two are running at this point. Um, and quite a few of them will definitely never start up because of problems they're discovering. 
But it's interesting. It's a it is a rebellion led by women, mm-hmm. um, which is uh, in, in Japanese culture is, is unheard of that women would stand up and take the lead in a political movement. Um, I I think what will happen. There's a, an election there um, this coming weekend, and um, it looks like the uh, pro nuclear um, sort of right wing uh, guy will win the election. Um, it, but it, but separately, there's all this turmoil on the on the Vermont Yank, uh, on the on the nuclear power in Japan. So the net effect is, I think we'll have an, more years of polarization, where the people don't want it and the government does. Um, Japan claims to be uh, shutting down nuclear power, but they have 40-year plans to not just continue to operate the plants they have, but they also authorize the continuing building of new ones. So I think the people got the message, but the government and the big industries didn't. Now, I looked at it as you had um, Nagasaki and Hiroshima as one bookend, and you had Fukushima as the other bookend. And you could put the nuclear error in Japan between those two bookends. And uh, I think the people in Japan felt that way too. But the, uh, but the government definitely wants to push that, that bookend out for another 40 more years. Mm-hmm. Arnie, what are you going to do next now? What, what, are, what are your plans for the, the, uh, the near future now as we head toward the end of 2012? Um, well, we're, we're putting a, a, a really cool video up um, uh, this week. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage your readers, to, your watchers here to, uh, uh, to see it. Um, and this is Fairwinds Energy Education, which was founded by your wife, Maggie Gunderson. Who, uh, who has been our guest here several times, and uh, she founded this Fairwinds Energy Education a few years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah Maggie sends her regards. Um, she's just yeah. not feeling well from a bad fall, yeah. um, and uh, would love to have been here. Um, yeah, we're a 501c3, and uh, we're in the process. We have, a, we have a fundraising drive to get enough funds to get us through the next year. No, Maggie and I don't take any money out of this, but it still costs money to run the servers and to get the mm-hmm. cameras repaired and stuff like that. Um, but we, um, we continue to shine the light on problems in Japan and uh, how the regulators here in the United States aren't doing their job either. Um, policymakers in Congress have co-opted Congress, and, and Congress isn't, pro, isn't anti-nuclear. There's only two or three mm-hmm. congressmen. But... Um, um, and, of course, a pro-nuclear Congress, whether they're Republican or Democrat, drives the agenda of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Yes. So, so we've been a voice out there trying to hold the light, hold a mirror to the face of the NRC and, uh, and show them that um, the, the path they're on is, uh, is not sustainable and is, in fact, very dangerous. It's an absolutely necessary voice. And uh, I, I come to the, the Fairwinds Energy Education as a source for knowledge in, in this terrible uh, problem that we have. And I, uh, I received a, a notice of another petition from the Nuclear Information and Resource Services that... Um, asking us voters to uh, petition the NRC commissioners and elected officials to close down the GE reactors that are similar to the Vermont Yankee. They're the Mark I mm-hmm. uh, GE reactors, and uh, they are Vermont Yankee Fuku- and Fukushima, but we're not petitioning in the United States for Fukushima to close, but, but for the... Uh, for the many, many Mark I boiling water reactors, Browns Ferry, Alabama, Brunswick, North Carolina, Cooper, Nebraska, Duane Arnold, Iowa, Fermi II, New York, Michigan, Fitzpatrick, New York, Hatch One and Two, Georgia, Hope Creek, New Jersey, Monticello, Nine Mile Point, New York, Oyster Creek, New Jersey, Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania, Pilgrim, Massachusetts, Quad Cities, Vermont, Illinois, Vermont Yankee, Vermont. You know, oh. Peach Bottom is <coughs> closer to Washington, D.C. than Fukushima Daiichi was to Tokyo. Mm. And when I was, if, if the accident happened at Peach Bottom, um, I, when I was in Tokyo, I, I sampled the soil in, in the city. Now we're talking about 150 miles away. And the soil in the city 
was um, radioactive enough to be to classify as nuclear waste. If it were in Vermont Yankee, that soil, it would have to be shipped and stored in Texas. And yet their entire capital, with 35 million people, is essentially walking on nuclear waste. Now, how would it put, put ourselves in those shoes? Okay, the accident happens at Peach Bottom. How would we feel if we walk? We had to walk around with um, with booties, gloves, and, and air filters in our own nation's mm -hmm. capital. Um, it's um, it, it seems like we've said that it can't happen here. In fact, the the Daiichi units are identical to Vermont Yankee. The, 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 this is an American design built by Americans in Japan. But the same Americans that designed it and the same Americans that built it in Japan built it here in Vermont. They built it at the Hatch plant in Georgia, built it out in uh, near Chicago, the Dresden plants. Um, it's the same design with the same problems. So I'm on record um, as say, I, I, I was in, invited to speak before the NRC um, a couple months ago, and I'm on record as saying those 23 plants should be shut down. It's, it's a risk that's just, why are we doing this? Um, when, when Maggie and I were, um, right before Fukushima Daiichi, three weeks before, this is February 2011, Maggie and I were walking one night, and she said, where's the next accident going to be? And I said, I don't know where, but I know it's going to be in a GE reactor. Mm -hmm. And son of a gun, three weeks later it happened. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a genius to see that this was a flawed design. And... Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it is in the process of destroying a state. Fukushima Prefecture is bigger than uh, the state of Connecticut. Um, so it's in the process of destroying a state and may still bring down a government. It's a, it's a dangerous situation. Yeah. Arnie, thank you so much for bringing bring us light on this, this uh, very disturbing subject. And I'm reminded that I have here the Helen Caldicott's book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer. And could you tell us where you're going to be in D.C., oh. right? With, with <laughs> Helen, uh, uh, Helen is running a, um, uh, on the second anniversary of the accident, um, Helen Caldicott is running a symposium in New York City. Um, and uh, has invited uh, you know, a whole bunch of, of leading scientists on the Fukushima Daiichi uh, accident. I'll be speaking there. Uh, Dave Lockbaum will be speaking there from Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, Bob Alvarez will be speaking there. Mm -hmm. and, and on and on. There's a two-day slate. And it will be um, U-streamed, which means anybody in the world can watch it on their computer live. Wonderful. Uh, so it'll be um, the, the, the 11th and 12th of March in New York City, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking before then, yes. and I'll give some details on it. Okay. Well, I well I hope that you will come back to the to to converse with us again at the Nuclear Free Future conversation. And thank you so much, Arnie, for joining me again, and our viewers. Thank you for listening and and viewing. Thanks for having Take me. Care, Happy Jordan. holiday. Happy holiday. Thank you.